Evening, I'm waiting for the uh, AV. There we go. We live in interesting times. Some sane, rational, even brilliant people are saying that this is the beginning of the end, or at least the end of life as we've known it on Earth for thousands of years. Other people are saying this is the dawning of a new era, an era in which our consciousness and our capabilities will be exponentially multiplied by our connectivity to one another. They're both right. And with our climate changing, we're going to need all the help we can get through our collective intelligence. Our story is an urban world, as you've heard tonight, and uh, China epitomizes this growth. China's seen the largest human migration in history of this planet in the past few decades, and that's going to continue. We had one billion urbanites 50 years ago. We have three and a half billion now. We're going to five billion by 2030. And while our population will plateau at some point later in this century, our urbanization will not. So we better get it right. The speed and scale of urbanization cannot be stopped. And when I say urbanization, I'm referring to suburbs and exurbs, squatter settlements, and the financial, cultural, technological, and educational centers. People ask, what's the one thing you can do to make a city more sustainable? That's easy. Stop asking the question, what's the one thing you could do to make a city more sustainable? <laughs> Cities are complex systems. They're controlled by interrelationships that are very dynamic and the diversity of cities is what gives them their strength against shocks and stresses. As the urban theorist Jane Jacobs said, diversity is constantly planting the seeds of successful cities. So we'll take these eight categories here and use them as a lens by which to examine cities around the world. And take note that the more solutions that are addressed by these, the more potent the solution is, the more solutions that address challenges. We start at the periphery of our cities. Uh, this is the edge of Colorado Springs after the wildfire burned a subdivision. That's ash from houses. And we're going to be seeing more wildfires with climate change. The lower the density that cities are, the more vulnerable they'll be to these types of risks. Tornadoes, superstorms, all these will pose more potent threats to cities because of low density sprawl. Low density sprawl also uses far more energy, water, resources, infrastructure, landscaping per capita than almost any type of development. So it's a losing proposition economically. And that is why we're seeing places like Las Vegas, where real estate is tanking. It has among the highest use of per capita water and energy, almost completely automobile dependent. Luckily, there are alternatives. Uh, there are web-based business models where you can go to Las Vegas and stay in someone's house. It might be under foreclosure, but you'll have a roof over your head. And it's a better use of resources. Let's move to Guangzhou, China, a city of 10 million. Guangzhou, just like five years ago, was besieged by traffic congestion, smog, that not only endangered human health, it also was a major risk to their growing economy. Guangzhou decided to implement Bus Rapid Transit System, or BRT. The system's fast, efficient and inexpensive. It costs less than a quarter to ride it, especially if you have your smart card to get the discount. It links seamlessly to low carbon or no carbon transit like pedestrian walkways and bicycle ways. And it's becoming a model for all of Asia. This is the most heavily used system for BRT of all Asia just after two years. 
Walk-in is another collective intelligence strategy for cities. And this is a web-based tool, Walk Score, that many of you might be familiar with here. This studio gets a 95 out of 100 in Walk Score. That means that you can walk to almost anywhere, bars, restaurants, schools, parks, playgrounds, bookstores, within one mile of this location. Now, the flip side is if you have a home or a business and it ranks under 50, or your city might rank under 50 in Walk Score, you're in trouble. That's distressed real estate, and if you're an employer, you'll have a hard time finding employees, especially ones that know about this tool that will require more money. <laughs> uh, not everyone can use public transit or walk or bicycle, so car sharing provides an excellent alternative in that you're dematerializing the need for cars parked all over our city streets. There are peer-to-peer -peer car sharing networks where you can own a car and let other people rent it out. And this is important not only for better land use in cities, but also it provides a digitization of our economy and it reduces the need to own stuff, especially stuff that weighs thousands of pounds and has a toxic and climate endangering life cycle. Of course, the bicycle is one of the most efficient forms of transportation in terms of human physiology, energy, and street city land usage. Paris's Velib bike share program is now a model around the world, Guangzhou included, and uh, it was so successful just after being implemented six years ago that they had a hard time keeping bikes at the hundreds of locations around the city. And so, Crafty programmers came up with a way in real time, because it's a smart car digitized network, to show exactly where bicycles are available and where they're not available. I think Monet would have approved, don't you? <laughs> Other web-based tools are allowing us to look at our cities in whole new ways. We could look at the carbon emissions on a block-by-block -block basis in New York City. And this allows us to save money, it allows us to be more efficient in terms of energy, it creates jobs and energy efficiency, and most importantly, it just allows us to look at our lives and where we live in a whole new way, down to our homes, our businesses, and our shops. Japan, after the earthquake in Fukushima nuclear disaster last year, they had a 30% drop in energy because 52 nuclear plants were taken offline, including Fukushima itself. Now, in most countries, this would have been an absolute disaster. It already was in terms of loss of life. But citizens there responded by going to their handheld devices or their computers and finding exactly what the power supply would be every single day. They're still doing that this summer. And they cut their consumption and during critical periods so that there was never rolling blackouts outside of the tsunami damage zones. The cities are functioning smoothly there. This shows that citizens can act together to create important change and to really also reduce the risk. There are now 50 less nuclear power plants operating in Japan, and it's still running. And if you think it takes a disaster to change behavior on that scale, think again. In the United States and around the world, people are using web-based tools to compare their energy use in their home versus others, versus neighbors or friends. Again, it saves people money, it saves money, keeps local money, it creates jobs, and it's a lot of fun for some people, and they learn about energy in a whole new way. And uh, when cities and neighborhoods and businesses and people compete to be greener, to use less energy, Everyone wins. The losers are those who don't compete. This is Japan also, uh, Toyota City. It's an example of a mini smart grid, a micro grid, that uh, the home there has PV solar on the rooftop, and the car is an electric car that could be charged from the home using solar. Now, the great thing about this is that when the home has low energy supply because the sun's not shining or it's cloudy, the car can recharge the home, and it's an interdependent system that really is elegant. And this is what cities are trying to do on a larger scale with a smart grid. 
It's a great alternative to the highly polluting grids we need now, where even if you have renewables on the grid, you have to back it up with fossil fuel energy, sometimes even more than the renewables themselves in terms of the amount of fossil fuels. Water has been something that's been overlooked by planners and managers in cities for a long time until there's a crisis. Guess what? We got a crisis. This is the <laughs> Brazos Riverbed in Texas last year during the drought of 2011. It's still going on today, the drought. And it's almost completely dry, as you see. This supplies some of the major cities of Texas with water. One alternative is in Singapore. This is a city of five million where they collect water on their rooftops and their landscaping and their medians just about everywhere in the city. 50% of the city of five million has surfaces used to collect rainwater. 30% of the city's water comes from the rainwater they collect. So they don't have to import it from Malaysia anymore. Not only that, but this cools the inhabitants inside the buildings. It cools the neighborhoods off. It filters pollutants. The only thing missing here are some edible greens in that rooftop. The humble street tree is a paragon of ecosystem services, and it's providing all sorts of benefits that are only now being understood, social, psychological, economic. So the people in San Diego came up with a crowdsourcing approach where they map street trees by their size and by their uh, age. And you could also find out the overall economic benefits of street trees, the carbon savings, the water savings, the greenhouse gas sequestration, the air quality benefits. You could even model your neighborhood, how much money is being saved, your block, your home, your property. It's a great tool. Of course, street trees can be used for food, too. And in San Francisco, not far from here, urban gorilla gardeners are grafting edible fruit on the trees that were previously sterile. And that's real fruit on the right, pears, that grew from the, the branches that she and others helped graft. So urban food production is critical in providing an alternative to global food chains, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, and just providing an educational model so people know where their food comes from and how it relates to the environment, because it does. Besides urban gardening, yeah, there's urban gleaning and urban foraging. And in uh, our suburbs particularly, where there's a lot of land just sitting around vacant, it could be used to grow food. In Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, they've come up with a fruit map that shows exactly where fruit is available for foraging on public land. And these types of applications will be critical for cities to, to manage, not only from the top down, but from the bottom up, from what people do, what they need, what they're learning. And I, I think they approve of this in Champaign-Urbana, hopefully. Now, besides quality of life, our collective intelligence will have to address the issue of resilience. Uh, climate change is going to bring a lot of change in our world. It already has. That's why it's called climate change, right? And so there's flooding. Uh, this is real de Janeiro. They had disastrous floods and mudslides a couple years ago, so they instituted a central command center where they could push out alerts based on weather forecasts, weather conditions in real time, use geolocation so if your elevation was at risk by potential flooding or mudslides, you'd be notified. But in addition to that top-down-like approach, we could also have social networks where people notify one another where the cooling centers are, where the shelters are, where the resources are that we're going to need during these times of flood or intense heat waves or superstorms, derechos, whatever it is. We conclude with an image of a floating community based on Buckminster Fuller's geodesic dome design. This is in Rotterdam, uh, Netherlands. And uh, it also houses an institute for studying new business models and new technologies related to climate change and climate change adaptation. Our collective intelligence is really only beginning to emerge, like barely perceptible green shoots in a barren field. The cities that rise up with Nature will succeed, but they will also require new forms of citizen participation. 
over the next few decades will be put to the ultimate test in terms of our creativity, our ingenuity, and our economy. Cities offer the most resilient evolutionary path, which is an extremely high value-added proposition made eminently more possible with our collective intelligence. Thank you.